Good morning and welcome to Sunday School here today. Uh, if you haven't um, grabbed one already or haven't brought your handout from previous weeks, this is the same exact handout as last week, but there are handouts once again there on the music stand. And uh, I'd ask that you uh, use the kindness to join me in standing. Each week we have started our class by singing together uh, the hymn that is found on the second page of the handout, There is a Green Hill Far Away, a um, wonderful gospel hymn, and uh, just so happened to be one of uh, Dr. Machen's favorite hymns. So let's uh, begin by singing There is a Green Hill Far Away. There is a green hill far away without a city wall Where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear but we believe it was for us He hung and suffered there He died that we might be forgiven He died to make us good That we might go at last to heaven Saved by His precious blood there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us see. Oh, dearly, dearly has He loved, and we must love Him too. And trust in His redeeming blood, and try His works to do. Hey, won't you join me in reciting also Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me. So before we begin, I just want to point out a few things about uh, our upcoming schedule. Um, as was mentioned in the announcements this morning, there will be no Sunday school next week. Uh, Lord willing, after the morning service, we'll uh, get ourselves organized and then have a fellowship meal together, and then after the fellowship meal is wrapped up and cleaned up, then we'll be having a hymn sing there in the far end of the fellowship hall, uh, so there is no Sunday school next week, and when we come back then in two weeks, uh, we are going to, for real, get into the book, Christianity and Liberalism, and so if you have the intention of reading along with, uh, with us as we track through it, um, the opening chapter, which is an introduction, is what we'll be uh, talking about in two weeks' time. And uh, so you might want to read that, or if you've already read it, thinking we would have been there by now, which would, is, would have been a reasonable assumption. Um, if you've already read it, you might want to review it as well, and we'll dive into the content of the book itself uh, in two weeks. Um, we have had a, a very slow pace, as you yourselves are all aware, in terms of laying the groundwork for uh, this important book. Uh, written 100 years ago, Christianity and Liberalism. Uh, the feedback I've gotten from many has been that there's a lot of appreciation for the pace that we've taken because we have really been putting a, a historical context to this book, um, right? a context of what's going on in the world. We're going to do more of that here in just a moment, but, but most importantly, a context of what was taking place in the church. And uh, as many have just commented on how helpful it has been to review some church history, just reminds me of how I think hungry we often are to have some understanding of what goes on, you know, in God's work in the world throughout the generations, aside from simply our our little snapshot, right? We're accustomed to what's taking place now, but but how about that bigger work of the Lord? And and of course, this has been a particular uh, slice of church history, one that is very relevant to us, 
because the events that were taking place ultimately led to the formation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1936. So it helps us understand our, our own heritage, our own roots, uh, who we are by the grace and providence of God. So, so thank you for that feedback. And again, I, I hope I haven't been testing anybody's patience uh, give, given the pace that we've been uh, taking, but really, again, uh, laying the groundwork for having uh, a solid understanding of the book itself, but as we'll see here, wrapping up today, the introduction, um, wh why it's very relevant for us. So last time when we got together, um, we looked uh, for a number of moments at uh, Paul's opening verses uh, to the, uh, in the letter to the churches of Galatia. And we did that because one of the things that I've been really trying to press home in an initial way is that we learned so much about the content of this book from the title of the book itself, Christianity and Liberalism. And I've, I've repented of using ampersand. I, instead of calling it this, this aggressive and, okay, this little aggressive conjunction, because there's so much that is tied up in Machen saying you've got, you've got this thing called Christianity and you've got this thing called liberalism. They're not the same, right? And that's his contention. The, the, some of the same language can be used. Uh, some of the same organizational structures can be employed to try to advance these two distinct things, but they're not the same. And he's quick to say, we're not talking about the personal matter as to whether any given liberally minded Christian is in fact a Christian. That's not the point of the book. The point, however, is to say that whatever might be the case about an individual, Christianity is not liberalism, and liberalism is not Christianity. And the book, of course, makes the case for that. We haven't yet really made the case for it in a thoroughgoing way, but, but that's the point, this aggressive little conjunction and. And so we, we went to Galatians because someone might say, well, well is that really appropriate? Right? Should, should we, as, as those who are evidencing you know, charity and grace towards others, should we really you know, draw the line that distinctly? Should we really stand up for, for doctrinal differences that at least some people would say are, are just a small matter, you know, a matter of degree, not a matter of substance? And of course, Paul at the beginning of Galatians does that very thing. Um, he, he tells them, if we or an angel from heaven or anybody else preaches to you a gospel other than the one you receive, let him be accursed. And, and Paul, there in the opening of Galatians, even speaks about how it is that it's another gospel. In other words, that sometimes the same terms could be employed, sometimes the same basic concepts could be talked about, but the meaning is fundamentally different. And so he's willing to draw that distinction and speak even in harsh terms of those who would be entering in secretly to trouble the Christians there in Galatia. So, so Paul was willing to say, no, there are things for which we must stand up for the gospel to point out the differences very clearly, very starkly when necessary, and even to speak in very judgmental terms of those who would hold on to another gospel that at the end of the day is not a gospel at all. There's no good news in what the Judaizers were preaching, even as uh, Dr. Machen would say there's no good news contained in what the liberal church of his day and of ours was preaching. And so it all has to do about, uh, ultimately, a departure from the true and living God. And, and it really is a poignant moment when Paul says, actually, to the churches in Galatia, you know, you've separated yourself from Christ. Right? If they, if they take hold of that false doctrine, they are doing nothing less than walking away from Jesus. And, and that is a tragedy. And that is something for which we need to remember these things are not merely ideas and concepts. The very heart of what we represent as Christians is bound up in these things. Well, having kind of made the case for at least in principle, this kind of book having a legitimacy to be written based on biblical precedent, uh, then we began to dive into your homework assignment, which was to think about the changes that were taking place in the broader culture there in the 1910s, 1920s, that really form this kind of um, assumption uh, in modernism of the day that there was this kind of inevitability to human progress. And that inevitability to human progress really said something about the fundamental goodness of the human condition. Because you may remember, what we've tried to say is that theological liberalism was Christianity's attempt to accommodate modernism. 
So liberalism was willing to say, let's change in certain details the faith that we're holding on to for the sake of having a better interface with the culture around us. The culture around us is guided by modernism, and so fundamentally this interface then was between the church accommodating itself to these modernistic tendencies. What was modernism saying? Modernism was saying, hey, look, the, you can, humanity, there's all this progress, all this growth, right? And, and that, I must say, something really profound about the human condition. We're, we're really pretty special. We can really, we can really um, uh, do an awful lot on our own. And so there was this fundamental sense of human virtue, human goodness, that was being measured, at least, by the material attainments of an industrial and technological society. So we wanted to say, let's, let's talk at least a little bit. What kind of changes were taking place in the broader culture that were part of this this, this impetus towards modernism. And, and we had a really nice discussion on some political matters last time. If you happen to have it, why don't you take out the, the outlaw or the, um, the homework assignment? And I, I know I haven't repeated this the last couple of weeks. So if you just have today's handout, you unfortunately don't have it. Um, but what I'm thinking is we'll just real quick work through some of these categories because I gave you some, some in, uh, places, uh, categories for investigation to think about what were the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s all about that kind of fed this, this sense of change and progress on the part of many. So how about, how about technology? Did anyone happen to come across anything in terms of medical, transportation, communication, industry that were part of the technological changes of the day? Edith. Well, um, Kodak was going gung-ho, okay. for one thing. Um, and also, um, you know, this idea of, you know, Progress and modernization, and like the re like the, re the redesign of trains and Art Deco. That whole that whole period was everybody was like very modern, and very clean, and very like you know none of the none of the organic kind of stuff from the previous generation. They had a real emphasis on technology. Technology became almost an aesthetic unto itself. This efficiency that is worked into all of these devices and. It also became much more accessible to the common man. Yes. Yes. So, yes, Beth? Well, there was just the whole idea that we just had the war to end all wars. I mean, that, you know, we can't even conceive of such a thing now, but that was such a swell of, that's it, we've got it figured out now, we've, we're, we're going to be okay, we won't have this war anymore, which would be a really big step. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine that attitude now. Right. Even though, even as it was not until the 19, early 1920s where we officially declared that the, that the um, hostilities had ceased. I mean, it really lingered for a long period of time, even into the, the period uh, right before the writing of this book. Yes, Adam? Kind of going along with the World War I, uh, outcome, the ramifications of World War I, you kind of had this whole idea, and it kind of goes against pro progression and modernism, is you have what is called the lost generation that comes out of this, where you have literature and thinking and and these people saying if this is all there is what is the point like, if, like looking at the battlefield you have millions of people slaughtered and, and just coming through that you have this whole idea of like what's it all for this is what it all is and what's the point and what's the point of, of doing anything let's just live for the day in spite of the the publicity or the the uh uh, propaganda around World War I that Beth is just mentioning, the, world, the war to end all world, wars, there was this recognition on the part of so many that that was an event of, of unfathomable human tragedy. Mm. And we're going to actually look at a quote here in a moment from Hemingway who really captured in some sense the despair that came out of that first world war. So you've got some people who are saying, oh, you know, this is, this is the war to fix all other wars, and others who were more proximate to what took place saying this was unspeakable the horrors that transpired. And along with all the loss of life in World War One, there was all the loss of life from the Spanish flu that they had come through. Right. I think again we felt yeah. like live for today because it's just gonna all end. Yes. You know? And and so yeah you had this mentality you need to live for today, carpe diem, you know, seize the moment. Um, and, and yet this these things are also reminding us that no sooner was the church starting to embrace this modernism We'll see this more in just a moment. 
And already things were starting to take a turn towards a different way of looking at the world. And so the church, in trying to look like the world, actually was just lagging behind the world, which is one of the real problems when we try to imitate the culture around us. We actually just end up being you know, half a step behind or maybe even further. And just, and just other like, things that were different about life. Um, anything that you... Yes, Dave. Electricity. Electricity, yes, yes. So by this point, or in the early 1920s, 230, two-thirds of folks had electricity. Uh, about a decade earlier, only 16% had. And once you have electricity, what else do you have? Lots more hours in the day. Because of what? Lights. You don't Lights. have to go to bed that dark. That's right. And you have refrigerators, and you have vacuum cleaners. Because you have vacuum cleaners, you can have carpets. I mean, you know, one thing just leads to the next, right? But yes, you have to pay for them. But you have to pay for those things, absolutely. No, but that's when installment plans started being a real Yes, yes. Um, buying things on credit. So now things were very available, but things were also made very accessible in terms of the financing of it. People were spending a tremendous amount on things that they weren't paying for at that exact moment. Uh, transportation. Some of this has been mentioned. Other things, yeah. Like the rise of aviation. Like you have the Glenn Curtis Company and, and others, and you had like those barnstormer events where oh, yeah. you had like people coming out in droves to watch aviation, watch these flyers, and watch watch what can be done. And I got that goes into the First World War with the with flight and aviation and the first you know fighter pilots and, and reconnaissance. But mm. you have this rise of, of aviation and, the, and just all like people being so interested in that. That's right, that's right. And so uh, some big names, right? Uh, Amelia Earhart, uh, Charles Lindbergh, milestone after milestone being toppled. It's like no sooner did it seem like, you know, one achievement was being uh, recorded than some other great achievement was taking place. Um, rocketry, uh, what was called the autogyro, which was sort of the predecessor of the helicopter. Um, you've got Firestone inventing inflatable tires for vehicles, like all these things related to transportation. How about communication? Um, what was kind of the paradigm shift there that took place Telephone. in communication? Telephone. Telephone? Radio. And radio, yeah. Radio was huge. Um, radio uh, in 1920, KOKA in Pittsburgh broadcast the presidential election returns. It was kind of the first sort of live broadcast. By the end of the decade of the 1920s, 12 million households had radios. <coughs> when you think about the number of individuals in a household, that was a really significant proportion of people. And what kind of things would you listen to on the radio? News, music. There was music, and already it was interesting. There's all kinds of specialties. What's that? Fibber McGee and Molly. So you have cereals <coughs> and, and other entertainments, yep. In yep. Italy, they listened to Mussolini. Ah, but political speeches of one sort or another, that's right, were, were rampant, um, all kinds of things. And as we, we heard from uh, WIP, you would, in 1935, you would hear Dr. Machen himself uh, give his, uh, his, his lectures that we have referred to uh, already. Um, industrial kinds of things, uh, what was taking place there? Moving away from agricultural society to one that's mechanized, working in cities and factories, accelerated. Yes. Tremendous. So it was in 1920 that for the first time 51% of Americans were living in an urban environment. We cross over the threshold of 100 million people, and of that 100 million people, 51%, a majority, were now living in cities. What happens when you're drawn into cities, or when people are drawn into cities? You need a Model T. Okay, you have issues with transportation. Mean, so basically, in terms of technology, that was, the Model T was like, wow. Right, so that enables certain uh, abilities to get places, to go downtown and go perhaps back home afterwards uh, if you don't mm -hmm. reside in the You're city. You need housing and, and all those things in cities to, to allow all those people to be in there. You've got to have housing and the municipalities and, and the, the sewers and, and all that stuff to allow them to live safe in a city in an urban environment. Right, that's right. And interestingly enough, the uh, rise in some of these industrial realities meant that uh, women in the workforce were more needful than ever. And a lot of times what you had is young, single, unattached women, and in some cases young, single, and unattached males going into the city environments. And they were in environments where there wasn't the family structure that there had been in previous generations. Think about the way in which that begins to shape 
uh, and, and, and the understanding of a family and the construct there. You also have the, the destruction of like the crafts, like when you were, if you wanted to be like a cabinet maker or whatever, you would live with the family and become an apprentice, a journeyman, a master mm -hmm. craftsman. Yeah. And you have the loss of that, where now you have mass production, so you don't need to have those skills. So again, it's kind of a breakdown of like, you became part of the family when you became and entered that trade, and you have that mm -hmm. loss where the, the owner <coughs> becomes more distant, and you're viewed more as like a, you're just the worker, and I'm up here. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you see that, again, these things are all interrelated, um, in an urban and industrial context, children are themselves not the asset that they are in that other kind of environment that you're describing, Adam, right? Where, where the contributions of members of the household are needed to make the household and its, its uh, particular um, uh, area of expertise uh, uh, viable. And so um, in, in about uh, 20 years' time, the average family went from seven children to three children just as a sign of you know, how children are viewed and how the household, um, uh, children being in, in not as much of an asset in an urban and industrial context. Richard, yeah. Well, people also were, they're not only moving to the city, but they were moving around the world in general. They, because, they, they, because of the war, they had learned about France, for instance, and the culture there, and Sweden, and uh, things outside of their normal environment. So there were so there's a lot more overseas travel. There was a lot more travel across the United States, mm -hmm. South America. One of the interesting things that, that happens, there are um, limits uh, uh, imposed upon immigration. And one of the things that that meant was that there was a lot of shipping capacity um, that was now available for other purposes. And they turned those into cruise ships. And so now folks who had more disposable income would do things like get on a cruise ship and use that as a source of, of, of leisure because immigration itself had been, had been, um, had been limited. Um, uh, so this issue of, of traveling. Uh, there was apparently uh, various um, trends and fads that would start where different cultures or nationalities would become uh, greatly interesting to, uh, to the culture at large. And apparently Egyptian culture and Chinese culture at that particular time were part of the fads that would just sweep over. Because there was this awareness of you know, different parts of the world and at least a stereotypical understanding of their cultures themselves. Um, we mentioned a little bit about politics. Um, women were given the right to vote in 1920, so that's right around this time, the 19th Amendment. Um, Prohibition, the 18th Amendment was right around this particular time as well. Those are changes. Again, a lot of what we're speaking of here is change. We're not applying value statements to, to things specifically, but these are great changes that are sweeping across the country in politics. Um, is anyone aware of a, an organization, certainly a, a, a very uh, terrible organization that was really rising in, in impact? In oh, I was just going to say organization uh, in terms of in terms of impact in the culture. Well, the, the YMCA basically, okay. I mean, the Maplewood YMCA was built in 1916, and the YMCA basically was behind the suffrage movement in a, in a, in a big way. Yes. 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 A part. Um, it was the Ku Klux Klan. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the KKK, which had already existed, but um, there was a surge of nativism, and there was a surge of unrest about the state of affairs in the country as a whole. And so at one point, um, about five million um, members were part of the Ku Klux Klan, and in certain states, um, some would say they, they literally ran the politics of, of those particular states. Uh, again, in a lot of ways, an extremely horrible reality, but it's also a telling one in terms of some of these things we've already talked about. If everything was, was all peaches and cream, right, why did you have such unrest that this number of people were looking at life saying, things are not how they should be? Now, it's a terrible response to things not being as they felt they should be, but it gives some sense that there was, you know, things were not settled in the psyche and conscience of the people as a whole. Yeah, Adam. The interesting thing about the Ku Klux Klan during this time is the largest numbers of members were not in the South. They were in the Midwest, in yeah. Indiana, and, and Ohio and Illinois had some of the highest membership rates of the Klan, which is, which is kind of a reversal of what it was earlier, where you have, you know, up in the the north, midwest part of the, of the country where you have the largest numbers. Yeah. 
Um, in terms of ethics and morality, does anybody know what a flapper is? <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother. <laughs> and what, 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 would, what would a flapper be like? So basically, along with the suffrage movement, basic, and women cutting their hair and whatever, basically it's like, okay, you know, women can do more and be more, and, you know, that kind of took some odd directions. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. You also had, the, in 1916, you had the founding of Planned Parenthood by, mm -hmm. by Margaret Sanger, who was yeah. herself an incredibly racist and, and immoral woman in her own right, but you had the... the that and that kind of devalued human life. You know, don't want to have a, a, a child, you can just get rid of it. You had the rise of eugenics as well, where the society people like Kellogg and other people short, sought to shape society by limiting the procreation of certain and shortening others. Wasn't it interesting that the groups that they decided should should be eliminated? So to put that kind of responsibility or that kind of authority in the hands of people, frightening, frightening thing. I think that I think that's sufficient to give us. I and mean, there's other things we could certainly talk talk about, but it does give at least a little bit of a reminder that this this was just an age of remarkable change, and that that change touched every part of life in, in, in so many ways. And, and when you think about that, I think there's a couple things that we could draw from it that will move us to our next, um, next idea here. On one hand, change of that magnitude is itself just unsettling, right? I mean, it just puts everybody in a place where you feel like the foundations you know, beneath your feet are crumbling. And so there's an unsettledness to it. Um, You'd certainly say that certain changes themselves are by themselves harmful, right? Again, some of these things we might even say are f fairly neutral, maybe even helpful from a standpoint of the welfare of humanity, the uh, convenience of humanity. Other things you say, no, 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 that particular thing is manifestly wrong and harmful. But then you have such change. You also have the idea that change itself philosophically is a virtue. Right? That, that the idea that, that things are always morphing, that new is always better than old, that today is always an improvement upon yesterday, that that becomes a kind of ingrained value system. That's a way of, of assessing things. And so we all sit around waiting, right? Uh, it was Google Day the other day, and Google showed off their Pixel Phone 8 because Pixel Phone 8 is guaranteed to be better than Pixel Phone 7, or whatever it is. You have this sense, right, that newer is always better than older. It becomes a value unto itself. And that value especially then associated with the idea of inevitable human progress. Even though, again, so many of these things that are being termed progress are really things that are external and material. And there's not this sense, what are these things doing inwardly, spiritually, to the real fabric of the human condition? Yeah, yes? I think there's there's an automatic, you said change causes um, unrest, there's an automatic disconnect between the older generation and the tried and true knowledge and the young whippersnappers who say, you know, my parents can't even figure out a computer. Why should I listen to them for anything else? Kicks Club this past week. I was a computer science major to start my college career. Uh, I needed uh, Ellie Schumacher to help me fix my computer um, to get uh, able to show a, a video to uh, to the kids at Kids Club. So yes, you know the whippersnappers uh, have something to offer to the old folks. But there's this disconnect between the generations um, and a uh, more of a willingness to criticize or to underestimate the value of prior generations that comes about. Well, if you, if you want to grab uh, today's handout, these quotes that I've got here, because I want us to think then, in light of this, this, this idea of change being itself virtuous and progress being baked into the human condition, this is what the church begins to embrace when it comes to theological liberalism. And as we've already mentioned, there were already things that were taking place even as the church is beginning to say, this is what we need to embrace, right? This idea of human goodness, right? The, the brotherhood of all humanity. You know, God is this uh, wonderful grandfather in the sky for all of his children, all throughout the world. Like this kind of very idealistic 
optimistic framework that the church was really beginning to imbibe very deeply. No sooner is the church beginning to do that than the culture was actually shifting underneath its feet. And what we find here is that the tragedy, among other things, is that they were relinquishing their inheritance, their birthright, for the sake of something that was offering only empty and vain promises. I want to read this quote up uh, at the top of the, the page here. Uh, th this was written by a man named H.L. Mencken. It was written in 1937. It was uh, Dr. Machen's obituary, actually. Now, H.L. Mencken was an essayist. He was uh, a commentator. He was a newspaper guy. He was really widely read in that day, and he was no friend of Christianity. Um, in fact, in this same obituary, the same eulogy for Dr. Machen, he refers to John Calvin as the Muhammad of Geneva Whoa. and uh, says of Reformed Christianity that he views it as just a little bit better than Calvinism. Uh, it is Calvin. Cannibalism <laughs> is what I meant to say. Cannibalism. Um, so the point is he was no friend of, of Christianity. But he does express profound um, appreciation for Dr. Machen, whom he called Dr. Fundam Fundamentalis. Um, he was the, a fundamentalist, but he was truly a thoughtful one. Uh, but, but listen to how this is commenting on the state of the church, the liberal church, that was chasing the tale of modernism. Machen saw clearly that the only effects that could follow from diluting and polluting Christianity in the modernist manner would be its complete abandonment and ruin. Thus he fell out with the reformers who had been trying in late years to convert the Presbyterian church into a kind of literary and social club devoted vaguely to good works. They essayed to overhaul the scriptural authority which lay at the bottom of the whole matter, retaining what coincided with their private notions and rejecting whatever upset them. Really, that, this is a beautiful summary, right? We've already seen hints of this in Fosdick's sermon, right? Shall the fundamentalists win? Changing God's word, rejecting things that are that are hard to grasp or that are unpopular in the present day. Now, as Dr. Machen would agree, anyone was free to reject the Bible as God's authoritative word, but no one was free to mutilate it or to read things into it that were not there. So here Mencken is criticizing right, that modernistic liberal tendency. He goes on to say, it's my belief as a friendly neutral in all such high and ghostly matters that the body of doctrine known as modernism is completely incompatible not only with anything rationally described as Christianity, but also with anything deserving to pass for religion in general. Religion, if it is to retain any genuine significance, can never be reduced to a series of sweet attitudes possible to anyone not actually in jail for felony. They, the modernists, have tried to get rid of all the logical difficulties of religion, yet preserve a generally pious cast of mind. It is a vain enterprise. What they have left, once they've achieved their imprudent scavenging, is hardly more than a row of hollow platitudes as empty as so many nursery rhymes. Isn't that a powerful indictment of this tendency on the part of someone who, as he says, uses himself as kind of a, a, a neutral... Uh, witness to this unfolding controversy, which is why he had so much admiration for Machen. He says, Machen held firm to his principles, and those principles were the only ones that made sense in light of the fundamental assumptions of the Christian faith. Now, Richard Rorty, in a later generation, um, said something very similar. He says, I'm delighted that liberal theologians do their best to accommodate Christianity. Now, Richard Rory, again, is no friend of Christianity. But what does, he, what does he say liberals do? They accommodate Christianity to modern science, modern culture, and democratic society. If I were a fundamentalist Christian, I'd be appalled by the wishy-washiness of the liberal version of the Christian faith. But since I'm a non-believer who is frightened by the barbarity of many fundamentalist Christians, for example, their homophobia, I welcome theological liberalism. Maybe, theologi maybe liberal theologians will eventually produce a version of Christianity so wishy-washy that nobody will be interested in being a Christian anymore. 
If so, something will have been lost, but probably more will have been gained. Isn't that a remarkable insight? Again, it's part of somebody who would love to see Christianity's demise, and who is essentially saying liberal Christianity is an important step towards Christianity's demise. Well, maybe this has in fact happened so wishy-washy that no one wants to be a Christian anymore. Listen to these stats from the most recent issue of New Horizons that have been put together by our General Secretary for Christian Education, Danny Olinger. Over one million ex-Presbyterians now identify as a nun, that is, having no religious affiliation. The loss of membership in the PCUSA is so rapid, PCUSA being the mainline Presbyterian church, it is so rapid, over 70,000 members per year since 2009, that's twice the size of our denomination every year being lost to the PCUSA, that within a decade, at its current decline, it will be surpassed by the Presbyterian Church in America, another uh, conservative Presbyterian group. In the early 1950s, over half of Americans, 52%, belonged to one of the mainline churches. In 2018, only 12% were members of mainline churches. But even more discouraging, only one-fourth of those who said they were members reported that they attend church on a regular basis. So from 1950 to 2018, such a precipitous decline. Why? The wishy-washiness of liberal Christianity leads people not to want to bother to be Christians anymore. It doesn't work. It's the tragedy of it. You try to accommodate the culture. You try to say, well, this will make us more relevant. This will make us more appealing. It does the opposite. Why would you want to be part of the church when you're already part of the world? If the church is just imitating the world, then just remain in the, in the world. There's no reason to add this extra layer to one's life. And then we have, again, this sense that things, even in Machen's day, were already beginning to shift in light of the realities of what was taking place. Ernest Hemingway said, I was always embarrassed by the words sacred, glorious, and sacrifice. Right? These kinds of words that were used to speak about the war to end all war, wars, World War I. He says they were, these abstract words, such as glory, honor, courage, or hallow, they were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the numbers of roads, the names of rivers, the numbers of regiments, and the dates. Right? You, know, you, you hold these, these high-minded terms that were intended to instill some sense of how humanity was really showing its virtues, even in the midst, in the midst of uh, the de- degradations and depredations of war. He says, no, measure what was happening there in terms of the names and the numbers and the towns that were annihilated uh, in that terrible conflict. Uh, Daryl Hart, um, a historian in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, says that Christianity and liberalism, the book that we'll be looking at more closely begin two weeks from now, censured liberal optimism and idealism for reasons similar to those of other writers and intellectuals who thought America, Americans' moral outlook did not comprehend the darker side of human affairs. The war proved that the accomplishments of technology, science, business, and education could not cure the disease of sin. And so these realities were smacking people in the face. And even as people were beginning to say, you know, there's something going on here that all of these mottos and all of these these platitudes are unable to solve, the church was embracing those things even more so and saying we're going to be willing to sell everything, to forfeit everything in order to hold on to this idea of human goodness and of human progress as a basic rubric of understanding the human condition. Well, in light of our time here, I just want to end with this very different approach that Dr. Machen takes. And this is actually, these are quotes from, not from the book itself, but from the first of his lectures that we've talked about a little bit that uh, were done on the radio about a decade later, uh, things that have been compiled, uh, 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 lectures compiled uh, into this book called Things Unseen. So this is how Dr. Machen begins in 1935 
that series of radio lectures. He says, at the very beginning, I may as well tell you plainly that I am not going to talk about the topics that are usually regarded as most timely just now. Because again, that was, that was the favorite liberal thing to do, to talk about the newspaper, to talk about world events, to talk about progress, and to talk about how the church can be used of God to have, continue to further progress. He says, I'm not going to talk to you about the gold standard. I'm not going to talk to you about unemployment. I'm not going to talk about the NRA. Now, that was not the National Riflemen's Association. That was the National Recovery Act, right? part of trying to recover from um, the Great Depression. I'm not going to talk to you about the Brain Trust, uh, FDR's uh, close counselors. It says, possibly some of you may discover that certain things that I may say may have a bearing upon those topics, but those topics are not the topics about which I'm going to talk. Instead, I'm going to talk to you about God and about an unseen world. Right? Not the newspaper, an unseen world and about God himself. He says, today the world is in a state far more disquieting than that which prevailed in 1918. Isn't that interesting? 1935, it's worse than it was in 19... Where's progress now, he's saying? Europe is armed to the teeth. Russia stands under the most systemic and soul-crushing tyranny that the world has ever seen. In Germany, fiendish wickedness is being practiced in the name of science. And in that country, as well as in Italy, even the form of liberty... To say nothing of the reality of it has been abandoned. I've just started reading a book about our, our American ambassador in 1933 to Berlin. right? And already, very ominous things were happening. If you had eyes to see, you could see what was on the horizon. <laughs> Civil and religious liberty is being treated openly as though it had been merely a passing phase in human uh, life. Well enough in its day, but now out of, doubt, out of date. In America... The same tendencies are mightily at work. Everywhere there rises before our eyes the specter of a society where security, if it is attained at all, will be attained at the expense of freedom. Where the security that is attained will be the security of fed beasts in a stable. And where all the high aspirations of humanity will have been crushed by an all-powerful state. Is this a time when we ought to be contented with things as they are? Is it not rather a time... And we ought seriously to ask ourselves whether there is not some lost secret with, which must be regained if humanity is to be saved from the abyss. What is true about humanity as a whole is also true, I venture to think, about you. The world is weary and perplexed today. How is it with you? Are you contented with your lives as they now are? I suppose that many of you are, but some of you, I know, are discontented and are looking for something entirely different from that which you now possess. That is true of rich as well as of poor. It is little to do with a particular situation in this world. To such hungry souls, I think I have something to say in this little series of talks, and there are many hungry souls today. But why is it that I have something to say to you? No, I certainly cannot expect you to listen to me because of any wisdom I, of mine, for I have none. I cannot expect you to be particularly interested in any opinions of mine that I may be bold enough to present. There is one reason, just one reason, why I may possibly expect you to listen to me. I may expect you to listen to me if I can bring to you a message from God. If I can do that, then the very insignificance of the speaker may in a certain sense be an added inducement to you to listen to him, since it may help you to forget the speaker and attend only to the message. It is just that that I am trying to do. I am asking you to turn away from me and from my opinions. I am asking you to turn away from yourself and your opinions and your troubles. And I am asking you to turn instead that you may listen to a word from God. What a remarkable way of introducing the call of the gospel, what we need to hold on to. It's the only thing we have to offer a weary and sin-sick world. If we give it up, there's nothing that we could possibly do to help anyone. David? Well, yeah, he wasn't even allowed to speak at his trial. Right. I'm just gonna throw that in. That's right. When he was actually uh, deposed from the ministry through procedural matters, he was silenced, unable really to give any meaningful testimony to defend what he had what he had done. That's right. Thank you. So in two weeks, we're going to go uh, dive into the introduction to the book.